Well, hello. We're here once more to see another case in this my new channel. Today we're going to be looking at the Belsunce case. If you have no idea who I am and maybe my accent is throwing you off a little bit, I'm from Argentina, so my mother tongue is actually Spanish, not English, so um, I don't know. I'm sorry. Also, I do have another criminal cases channel. I'll leave it in the description below. This is a very, very known case in my country, so I thought let's make it for more people. Let's make it, you know, worldwide. I do not know how many people know this case, but there is a documentary on Netflix. So, you know, if you want to go watch that and if it's actually on your country, then by all means do it. After watching my video though, please stay. I'm begging. I'm not going to make this much longer, so let's just get into the video. The woman you're looking at was Maria Marta Garcia Belsunce de Carrascosa. She was born on April 24th, 1952 in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Maria Marta was born in Capital Federal. She was the daughter of Horacio Garcia Belsunce and Luz Maria Galup. She had two brothers and three stepbrothers. Shortly after her birth, her mother decided to divorce and remarry to Constantino Urtig, with whom she had two children, Irene and Juan Urtig. It was not very common for marriages to divorce at that time, which is why after the separation of Maria Marta's parents, a tension was created in the family that lasted for many, many years. Despite all this, Maria Marta had a normal childhood. Her family was pretty well financially, so she enjoyed pretty much everything that that entails. And they all describe her as an independent girl, strong in character and caring. Especially the caring part, I think we'll see that going further into the video. In 1970, at the age of 18, she got engaged to Carlos Carrascosa, a young man she had known since she was little. Here's the thing. Carrascosa was eight years older than Maria Marta, and he met her when she was nine and he was 17. So you can see pretty much a good age gap, right? So Carrascosa was a merchant marine. In the year 66, he began a boat trip around the world. Upon returning, he met again with Maria Marta and began a relationship. She was, at this point, legal. You know, she wasn't a child, but the age gap, you know, it's still there. Though it's not actually a problem. According to him, this was blind love. They were so in love. A year after they got married, she was only 19 and he was 27. From that point on, they would continue their lives together. Maria asked Carrascosa to abandon his life as a merchant marine, since she did not want to be married to someone that she would not see for long periods of time. Carrascosa accepted this and entered the world of stockbrokers. Being that it was the 90s, he did quite well. It was said that their lives were actually quite well. There were no major conflicts and they were very independent from each other. After raising a large amount of money, Carrascosa decided to retire at age 50. With the money they had, they bought a piece of land in the private Karma Country Club neighborhood, where the couple lived until the fateful day of the murder. So here's a little explanation because I have no idea who's watching right now and where they're from. I'm gonna explain this the best I can. So in here, in Argentina, we have private neighborhoods, which means it's like a suburban area. There's a lot of houses and surrounding that area, it's a lot of security. So you have houses, you know, cars that cannot go faster than 20 kilometers per hour, a lot of kids, a lot of families. Most of the times they also have courtyards, you know, like places to do sports. And usually the people that live in those areas are, you know, rich. Also, might have forgotten to say this, there's a lot of fences around the neighborhood. To go in, you need to pass the security and actually confirm that the people that are inside are expecting you. They move there because it's safe and it's actually a nice place, usually. Unfortunately, Maria could not have children. It is perhaps for this reason that a very supportive side was awakened in her. She was a member of several organizations destined for charity. She also became vice president of the association Missing Children Argentina where she actively participated and was also involved in the investigation of child abduction networks. So given all of this context, let's see 
the day of the event. So all of this, by the way, is a reconstruction based on Carrascosa, Irene Urtig and Guillermo Bartoli. It was October 27, 2002, a Sunday like any other. Maria Marta and her husband were having a normal day. They had lunch at the house of some friends in the country. On Sundays, usually, Maria Marta played tennis with her friends. This all happened on the afternoon. However, that day there was a storm, so the tennis match was interrupted. Maria decided to go to her sister Irene's house. I've changed it. If you didn't notice, I've changed the pronunciation of this because it's quite easier to just call her Irene, though the pronunciation here is Irene. She lived in the same country, so it was easy for her to just go to her house. At this house is where Maria Marta's husband was waiting for her because he was watching just a soccer game, a football game. And in fact, it was a classic. It was one of those important matches. It was a Boca River game. Once the game was over, around 6.10 p.m., Maria returns to her house by bike, since at 7, she had a massage session in there. Maria came home alone since her husband stayed with Irene's husband, Guillermo Bartoli, watching another game there at the house. A few minutes before 7 o'clock in the afternoon, Carrascosa returns to his house. By the time that he arrived, there was a security guard from the country at the door that was telling him that they tried to communicate to someone inside the house because a masseur, Beatriz Michelini, was at the door trying to get in. They had to enable their entry but no one was answering. Finally, Carrascosa authorizes the entrance of the masseuse and goes in the house. Inside, it was very quiet and he started shouting Maria while he went through the house, but she was nowhere to be found. So he finally climbs the stairs and reaches the bathroom and finds the worst scene. Blood stains everywhere and Maria's body half submerged face down in the bathtub. Carrascosa, who at that point thought it was an accident, takes Maria out of the bathtub and drags her body until he leaves it at the bathroom door and tells her that her sister had had an accident. At that time, Beatriz, the masseuse, arrives, to which Carrascosa asks her to go and help him. After this, Carrascosa finally calls an ambulance. In a few minutes, Carrascosa, Irene, Bartoli, and Beatriz were, in theory, in the house trying to do CPR on Maria. Around 7.30 p.m., the first ambulance arrives. The doctor tries everything possible, but Maria was already dead by that time. About 15 minutes later, another ambulance arrives. This was the one that reception called. And another doctor, different doctor, examines her. So this is important. There are two doctors that actually checked on her, examined her, tried bringing her back to life. And also the whole scene is contaminated because there's so many people inside the house. By the way, up to that point, it was just an accident. It wasn't a murder. I have to also explain this. Everything was covered in blood. She was covered in blood. That made it pretty hard to see what happened to her. And this is where the problems begin. So, first, Carrascosa tells the first doctor that he believed that Maria had an accident in the bathroom. When the doctor examines her, he notices that Maria had a wound on the side of her head. Before letting the other relatives see all of this, he asks Beatrice, the masseuse, to clean everything a little so that the scene is not so shocking for the rest of the family members. And as you know, by now, this scene was an actual crime scene, so cleaning really bad. Cleaning equals bad. Little by little, more people were arriving at the house, Maria Marta's brothers, parents, and friends. Everyone heard the version that Maria Marta had had an accident, and it was even said that both doctors who examined her had endorsed this. However, there was something missing in the version of the accident. That is why the next day, a prosecutor came to investigate. All of this happening while Maria was bailed and about to be buried. So by the time the prosecutor was there, in the house, checking out the situation, everyone already had the idea in their heads that Maria Marta had died out of an accident. Diego Molina Pico, the prosecutor, was present while everyone was mourning her. Trying to appease the suspicion, he said to everyone that he was there just carrying out 
standard procedures. However, all the testimonies that he took out of the people that knew her or that were around when the accident happened indicated that they believed it was an accident. Because of this, the prosecutor withdrew and Maria Marta was buried in the Recoleta Cemetery. Almost a month later comes the first of the many turns in the case. When the prosecutor summons the second doctor, Santiago Biasi, who actually saw Maria Marta to testify. He told the prosecutor that when he examined her, he noticed signs of bullet shots. He said that he told the family that the cause of death was doubtful and that an autopsy should be done. When the prosecutor heard this testimony that contradicted everything the family had said, he immediately contacted Horacio Garcia Belsunce, Maria Marta's brother trying to ask for some kind of explanation. It is then that more things are discovered that do not fit this narrative. The two most important are the death certificate of Maria Marta's that was completely false. This death certificate said that Maria Marta died in Capital Federal from a cardiorespiratory arrest and also the famous story of the pituto. If you don't know what a pituto is, because why would you? I will explain. But first, the neighborhood where they were wasn't in Capital Federal, which is here. It was here. Both certificates are different and it is very important for certain things, which I will explain later. So let's continue with the story of the Pituto. Apparently, at one point, they found a small piece of lead under the body of Maria Marta, which Horacio called Pituto. This small piece of lead was actually confused with a shelf support, like a little piece of a shelf support. He said that it wasn't suspicious at all and that he threw it away and that they found it the day of the accident and flushed it down the toilet. You may be assuming now that that little piece of lead was actually, you know, other thing. With all these circumstances, the prosecutor decided to do an autopsy on her body almost one month and a half after the death and after the body was already buried. The autopsy revealed details that completely turned the case upside down. Maria Marta had five bullet holes and one more bullet wound to the head. From now on, it was no longer an unfortunate accident in the bathtub. It was a homicide. After this, the prosecutor ordered a more exhaustive investigation. DNA samples were taken, the septic tank was searched, and yes, they were actually there for 9 hours looking inside all of the waste to find this pituto, this little lead thing. And actually, they did, they found it. And you know what this thing was? A sixth bullet. It was another bullet that they had thrown inside of the toilet. So after finding this, it was possible to know that the weapon used was a 32 caliber revolver. It is then that the prosecutor suspects that something strange was happening within the family, since there were many inconsistencies in what the family had said and what was found in the expert reports. That is why he said he started believing that everyone was covering up for the murder and that the main suspect was Carrascosa. Meanwhile, the family defended his innocence and the suspicions were centered on another person. It was Nicolás Pachello, a neighbor inside the country who had a troubled background, let's say. So there were two suspects, the husband and this neighbor. Nicolás Pachello had been in trouble with the law for selling drugs. In addition, everyone in the country suspected that Pachello was the culprit for several thefts that happened in there. Undoubtedly, he was a suspicious person. However, the prosecutor did not see enough evidence to charge him, especially because he had an alibi. He allegedly was in Capital Federal at the time of the events. Finally, Pachello was ruled out as a suspect and only participated in the proceedings as a witness. The prosecutor continued to maintain the hypothesis that Carrascosa was the culprit. There's a small detail in here about Pacello, and that is that his mother committed suicide by throwing herself off the balcony of her building when Pacello was involved in accusations by the Garcia Belsunce family and the media. While this might have been just her not, not wanting to deal with all of this and being, you know, depressed, some say that it might have been because, you know, they were right. 
that she couldn't actually deal with this because her son was involved in a murder. Or maybe, or maybe because he actually told her. So that's how in 2007 Carrascosa was brought to trial. While Horacio Garcia Belsunce, Irene Urtig, and Guillermo Bartoli, among others, were charged as accessories. The trial lasted about four months. More than 230 witnesses passed. Many witnesses contradicted each other. Some claimed to have seen Carrascosa in another place that he claimed to be. The doctor confirmed that he had warned the family that the death was doubtful and that it was not an accident. Finally, a ruling was given. Carrascosa was found guilty of the crime of cover-up and sentenced to five years in prison. In other words, Carrascosa was accused of murder and ended up being sentenced for concealment. And in an even stranger twist in the case two years later, after the prosecutor Molina Pico appealed the sentence, the Buenos Aires Cassation Court decided that Carrascosa was guilty of the murder of Maria Marta and was sentenced to life imprisonment. And in a third plot twist in 2016, the Supreme Court of the Province of Buenos Aires acquitted Carrascosa of the homicide, leaving him free of guilt. All of this time he was saying he was actually not guilty. Um, take that as you will. In total, Carrascosa spent seven years in jail, two of which actually were in house arrest. Since he was above 70, had the benefit of house arrest. On the other hand, those who had been charged as accessories, Irene, Horacio, Guillermo, etc., in 2011 were brought to trial and were found guilty. All received sentences of between three and five years in prison. They all paid bail and spent no more than a few weeks in jail. The last thing that is known about this case is another plot twist, actually. I really like the fifth plot twist, or like the fourth. I stopped counting. But there's a lot, actually, there's more. The one who is under the spotlight, again, is Nicolás Pacello. It is because in 2015, Pacello made the news again, this time not because of the case of Maria Marta, but because he was involved in the sale of illegal substances at certain parties, like rapes, in addition to being part of a gang that was dedicated to robbing houses. This is the reason actually why he ended up in prison. In 2017, Pacello was charged after 15 years as a suspect for the murder of Maria Marta. The hypothesis is that he, along two other people, who were security guards of the country, entered the house to rob. But Maria Marta surprised them by returning home earlier than expected, you know, because of the storm and everything. And then when she recognized Pacello as one of her thieves, he killed her. Pacello is currently awaiting the trial that was to take place in August previous year, but was postponed due to the pandemic. So let's get into some of the theories of this case. Before starting with the theories, it should be noted that at the time, the case was very mediatic. So it was very popular on TV, it was everywhere, everyone was talking about it. So there's a few problems with that. And that is, first, misinformation, and second, a lot of just dots about this case. Just maybe incorrect ones, maybe some correct ones, and you know, the media actually made this case the front page of everything. They actually, I'm not gonna say that they invented some things, but they kind of did. They were, they were making rumors into news, so that was a problem. <laughs> they just think probably till this day that those are just facts. Let's begin with the first theory. Carrascosa was the culprit. This theory was supported by the prosecutor who investigated the case and has several elements in favor. The first is the large number of inconsistencies between the first testimonies and what really happened. The family maintained that it had been an accident and even said that the doctors had endorsed this, that they too said it was an accident. But as we saw, one of the doctors assured that he never said that and that he had told the family that the death was doubtful. In addition, during the trial, evidence and testimonies were shown that said that Carrascosa had not been at Irene's house during the period of 6 to 7 p.m. 
you know the time where the murder occurs. They said that he was in another part of the neighborhood, which was like a country house, you know, a club, drinking coffee and limoncello, and that he left after that, but that he wasn't at Irene's house. Another piece of information that did not fit in Carrascosa's story is that he said that Beatrice the masseuse had entered the house at around 7 p.m., while several guards said that Beatrice did not enter the country until 7.20, though to me, actually, that doesn't mean that much because in a shocking situation like this, it's hard to remember times and to calculate, you know, when everything happened. I wouldn't take that that harshly. There were many things that did not fit this story, and all of this added to the fact that they cleaned the crime scene, flushed evidence, and made a false death certificate. That was weird. The false certificate. Though, to be, then again, fair, to be honest with all of you, actually the death certificate thing, as some other papers, usually there's people that, you know, make them up. Just because of legal reasons, for example, she wouldn't have been able to be buried in that cemetery without the false death certificate, because she didn't die in here, in Capital Federal, but she died all the way up there, so... Loss and everything, I don't know how else to explain it, it's, you know, like, you died in another place, you have to be buried there. So usually they would pay people to just <laughs> fake the certificates to allow them to be buried in there, in the city. So yeah. Also, it's not the only paper that people fake. There's a long list of papers in here that people fake for similar reasons, you know? So while there's much evidence that makes the family suspicious, there are also many things that are left without sustenance. For example, there was no motive for why they would kill Maria Marta and why everyone would just hide it. There was a lot of speculation in the media, such as that Maria Marta was a lesbian and that she was unfaithful to Carascosa, Things like that actually hurt the case a lot, because it's just not realistic that everyone would just hide the truth like that, if that was the reasoning. By this point, 2021, we would know, you know? Someone would have come out to say what actually happened. Nobody does. The prosecutor also considered the possibility that part of the family was involved in drug trafficking with the Juarez cartel. Why would it be the Juarez cartel? I have no idea, like actually no idea. In fact, I've made a video about that just recently in my main channel. And it's like, why would it be that? Why would it be that? We have other countries that are very, very much into drug trafficking. That's just a media thing, you know what I mean? Like, there's no signs of why that would be. <laughs> it's just a media thing. Nobody would think that. It's not that they found Maria Marta's body in a way that would be classic of the Juarez cartel or some Juarez cartel, you know what I mean? It's, it's not, that's not how it works. So anyway, the theory says that they used Maria Marta's accounts, you know, bank accounts, that she had with her associations to launder money and that when she discovered them, they killed her. And that's why everyone's just being quiet. However, this hypothesis was not investigated. And also, while you may think they are super rich, I mean, if they were making that much bank because of, you know, the drugs, they would have bigger houses, I would think. I don't know, just give me your opinion. So there's another theory, and that is that the family is straight up stupid, just not only clumsy, but really, really dumb. They, there is the chance that they may not have realized that it was, you know, a crime scene. Then again, I will repeat this because I said it on Instagram when I did this case for my main channel. They're in a shocking situation, okay? You find your loved one right there, you know, shower, messed up, there's blood everywhere. While you may think that right now, you know, like right now, we may think that that is weird, when you walk in and you just see your partner, a lot of blood everywhere, and you know, 
you just call the family like something happened you know they're dead something just went wrong you don't think hey this is a crime scene you don't think hey um sh this person was killed you don't think that you just think of an ambulance you think hey let's take care of this Let's make sure we do everything we can to save this person, you know? The only problem here is that, you know, they cleaned the scene. But also, if you think it's just an accident and there's blood everywhere, you really can't see the holes in there because of all of the blood. You wouldn't think, hey, let's just investigate this. This is a crime scene. You wouldn't think that. And even if you sit here right now and tell me, yeah, no, I would think, no, you wouldn't. You wouldn't think that. Nobody in their right minds would think, yes, this is a crime scene. Someone killed them. No. Also, normal people wouldn't know how much blood is a lot of blood and how much blood comes out of a wound or what kind of wound. You know what I mean? usually wouldn't know how much an arm bleeds. Just you wouldn't, like I, I don't. I Well, I know now because of all of the years of cases that I got in my brain, but usually a normal person wouldn't. The other weird thing that if they didn't have anything to do with this case, with this crime, then they are very dumb. And that is that they threw away a bullet they flushed it down the toilet. Like you could have just thrown it in the trash, you know? Just throw it in the trash. Why would you flush it? Makes no sense. So the last theory is that Nicolás Pacello did it. Although from the beginning, Pacello was accused by the family as a suspect, there was not much done to investigate him. The trial has not yet been held, so it is not known what evidence prosecutors have to say that Pacello is guilty, but he has a long record. In addition, his main alibi for that day was that he was in the capital at the time of the events, but who supported this alibi was Pacello's mother, who killed herself. So, that's weird. So there's, you know, a last theory about what she did during her life that she was helping children and that actually she was investigating kidnappers and people that just sold children. Maybe there was a group out to kill her in the sense of she discovered something or was about to discover something or someone and they decided to just take her out of the map, I guess. There's not much evidence to actually take this as a full-on theory or hypothesis, so yeah. I'm just saying it as a possibility, but I do not think that's the case. Or maybe it is. I don't know. Those groups are really messed up, so it might be. But we have no proof, so yeah. But well, what do you think? Did you watch the documentary? What do you think of all of this situation? Who do you think is guilty? I'll be there just reading the comments about what you think. Um, I expect... I expect like a little bit more of a neutral comment section based on the fact that this is not going to attract many people from my country. I expect, I expect that. Please just let this go to other countries because I'm tired of the narrative here because every time there's a case based on a certain country, of course, every case is based on a certain country, but like, you know, when there's a lot of people that have seen it in the in the main country, they have an opinion based on what the media has said. It's very annoying. It's impossible to be neutral in these cases with that information being thrown around everywhere because people really think that they have like the truth of the case and they do not realize that they have seen a lot of lies just being thrown there. It's ridiculous, it is ridiculous, and um, I'm really tired. So I do want other opinions that do not come from my country, just to see what other people have to say about this. If you want to watch the documentary, please do. And yeah, that's about it. I hope you enjoyed. Um, I'll see you around, I guess. I, I don't know. I do not know how to end this. So yeah. I have no idea. Well, uh, bye-bye, I guess. Bye-bye.
take care. We'll see... I'll see you next time. Hopefully. Please stay. Bye-bye.